right, so first thing is I'm going to give a broad overview of um, the structures of the spinal cord. Then I'm going to try to describe the different spinal cord syndromes that we find uh, relating to clinicals, right? So I'm sure you, you have watched um, um, a video on internal features of the spinal cord, which really gives you um, what the cross section of the spinal cord looks like. So forgive my drawing, I'm just gonna draw something. It's going to look like this, then it's gonna go like that. And it goes out, then it goes back. Um, goes something like that, right? Um, it's not really going to be a true representation, but then I'm going to have the ventral one. So this idea is anterior because you have an anterior median fissure. A fissure is quite deep, but when you go to the back of the spinal cord, there is just a sulcus, meaning you don't expect to see such um such um a deep fissure as is in the front. So you have your anterior one, right? Um, then in some regions of the spinal cord, you can have a lateral one, right? Then you can have a posterior one that actually contacts the spinal cord at the back. So something like this. So for you to tell which side of the spinal cord it is, the part where the one, the gray one, this is the one that I'm drawing inside, touches the spinal cord at the at, at, at its surface. That's the posterior surface. The number two, where you see a deep fissure, where I've put the X there, that's your uh, anterior surface because that's where you have the anterior median fissure. Right. So you're also going to have the same representation at the back. Also the same at the front. Also the same on the lateral. Right. So the, the, the this H-shaped structure, then you have this hole at the center, which for now I just want you to know it's called the central canal. I'll talk about this when we talk about the ventricular system and cerebrospinal fluid. Right. So the gray matter for the spinal cord is at the center, then the white matter is on the outside, which I always see um, it's different from what is in the brain, where the gray matter in the brain is on the outside, then the white matter is on the inside. Right. So this gray matter has an anterior one, it has a posterior one in all regions of the spinal cord. But in the thoracolumbar spinal cord, you have an additional one called the lateral one, which carries sympathetic fibers. From your nerve and muscle physiology, I'm sure you say that sympathetic outflow is via the thoracolumbar spinal, uh, spinal cord. Though it comes from the hypothalamus through a tract called hypothalamus spinal, we'll do all those when we do the brain, but the outflow will exit from the thoracolumbar, as opposed to parasympathetic, which is cranial, meaning cranial nerves, three, uh, cranial nerve number seven, cranial nerve number nine, and number 10, sacral, S2 to S4 as well, right? So the reason why I've drawn this, remember I say there's something called the Belmagendi law, and what simply the bell magenta law entails is that motor is anterior, sensory is posterior. So that dosa, uh, these dosa ones, they are going to receive sensory. Right? So if you look at the proper diagrams, there is going to be um, a fiber that enters the posterior one, but just before it enters, it synapses at something called a dorsal root ganglion. Right. Then from the dorsal root ganglion, things go inside. Right. Then motor is anterior. Right. That's where you have the anterior one cells. So that's where you come up with a, um, a concept uh, where we say there's an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion. The lower motor neuron is 
really the neurons that exit from the anterior horn cells going to the periphery, right? Then the upper motor neuron is the neuron that you find within the central nervous system, meaning in the spinal cord and the brain. But the proper definition for a lower motor neuron is the final single most neuron that is going towards an effector organ, the last neuron going towards an organ without those other connections, that becomes a lower motor neuron, right? That would be a different talk, but we want to do spinal cord, right? So the region that I have not drawn, where I'm going to put red as a color, these regions, this is going to be your white matter, right? And you can see that the white matter, there's a part that is anterior, there's a part that is lateral, there's a part that is posterior. On this side, there's a part that is anterior, there's a part that is lateral as well, right? Those are what we call funiculi. So there's an anterior funiculi, lateral funiculus, um, posterior funiculus, whatever you want to call them. So the reason why gray matter is called gray matter is because that's where the cell bodies are. The reason why white matter is called white matter is because that's where you have the axons that are myelinated, right? So remember the spinal cord, when we did the first talk, we say that it's essentially uh, a connecting pathway between the brain and, um, and, and, and everything else, right? So you have fibers that are either going up or going down. Where are those fibers? Those fibers are in the white matter, right? So I want you to know what's important, right? Number one, in the dorsal column, yeah, where I'm putting the bread box, right? We find something called, um, let me just write, gracilis and cuneatus. So in that dorsal column, there is the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus. When I was um, still doing anatomy as a student, I, I used to say that, you know, in the lower limb, there's a muscle called the gracilis, right? So that fasciculus gracilis is dealing with the lower limbs. Then I'll just remember that the fasciculus cuneatus therefore deals with the upper body, right? So in terms of representation, okay, maybe before, before I go there, these two fasciculi, fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus, they carry fine touch, proprioception, and vibration. So spinal cord starts lower down, right? So you start by adding fibers from lower down as you go up. With, with respect to, to, to sensory. You start to add fibers from the lower limb, and as you go up, you start to add fibers from the upper body. Meaning in that dorsal funiculus, the, the, um, the gracilis is medial because it's for the lower limbs. That's what you're going to put first. Then the cuneatus is lateral because you're going to put that second, right? Okay. Then um, there are other fibers that we call, okay, before I go there, there's a concept of, of decussation, right? So generally, when you look at the brain, the right brain controls the left body, then the left brain controls the, the, the right body, right? So as these fibers are coming for, for example, from the left, they will need to cross the proper term that we're going to use is decussate. They'll need to decussate at some point to go to the opposite side, which we call the contralateral side. Right. So this decussation can either happen within the spinal cord or it can happen in the brainstem. So it basically depends on the, uh, the pathway that we're talking about. For these two that I've told you, 
the gracilis and the cuneatus. As they are in the spinal cord, they travel on their side. For example, if it's on the left, it's going to go ascend the whole spinal cord on the left. It's going to end up on the right brain, but in the spinal cord, it remains on the left side. It will only cross in the medulla when you're now in the brainstem, right? Such that when we discuss spinal cord syndromes, you'd find that if you have a lesion, in terms of, I remember I say this is fine touch, you have fine touch, you have proprioception, then you have vibration, right? So in terms of those things, you lose them on the same side. Because if you are having fine touch, proprioception and vibratory fibers from the left body, for example, going up in the left spinal cord, if you cut there, you have cut fibers for that side. Then number two, there is a special type of fiber called cortico. Cortico means it's coming from the cortex of the brain. So we have already called cortico spinal. These are basically the motor fibers, right? Motor means they control muscle. Grossly, we're just going to say motor fibers. These fibers, I know you haven't done the brainstem and what, but what I want you to know about these fibers is they cross inside the brainstem such that if I add a fiber, I'm going to draw a, a, um, a little brain here. So let's say this is left, this is right. So if I had a fiber coming from the left brain, whilst in the, um, the medulla, it's going to cross in the pyramidal decussation to come to the right. Because remember I said that the left brain controls the right. And of course, there are exceptions, but for now, I want you to get the concept. So when these fibers are in the spinal cord, they are now traveling on the side that they are going to innovate. Because these fibers, if they've crossed in the brainstem and it's now on the right side, this corticospinal tract is traveling on the right side where it is going to innovate. So if I get a problem in the spinal cord and I transect the spinal cord, I'm going to lose motor function on that side. Why? Because the fibers have already decussated. They are now traveling on the side where they are supposed to be, right? Then the last one that I want you to know is something called um, spinothalamic. Spinal means it's coming from lower down, right? Thalamic, it's going to the thalamus. So when we do the diencephalon, we're going to find that um, the thalamus is basically the relay station for all sensory information. So all sensory information in the body goes to the thalamus first with the exception of olfaction, the sense of smell, right? So what happens with spinothalamic? Spinothalamic crudely, it carries pain and temperature. So that's coming from lower down the periphery, it's going up. Right. So what happens is these spinothalamic fibers, when they enter the spinal cord, they immediately cross. So they can either ascend. So let me draw somewhere. Uh, let me use a different color, maybe blue. So let's say this is my spinal cord. It's divided into two in blue. So when I have spinothalamic fibers coming, let's say here, this fiber can either ascend one or two segments up, or it can descend one or two segments down, creating something called a dorsal lateral tract of Lissois. Right. So they create something called a dorsal lateral tract of um, 
of Liswa. Then they cross with, so they can either go one or two segments up or they cross in that segment to the opposite side. So the point that I'm putting there before complicating to talk about this going up or down is when spinothalamic fibers enter the spinal cord, they cross to go to the opposite side. So if you get a spinal cord injury, for example, a hemisection, you affect one side. Let's say I'm, I'm, I get something called brown sequad, then I happen to cut the spinal cord on this side. Can you see what's happening there? I'm going to cut on the right, but on that right side, the pain and temperature fibers that are there belong to the left side. So I have an injury on the right, but I'm going to lose pain and temperature on the contralateral side, the opposite side. Why? Because the fibers, they enter the spinal cord and they immediately decasset, which is different from what I talked about with the gracilis and cuneators, which I said in the spinal cord, they travel on their own same side before they decasset within the brainstem going up there, right? So when you have this kind of a background, life becomes really easy for you to understand spinal cord syndromes. So um, spinal cord syndromes, you can have either a complete, um, maybe maybe I can use text for now. So you can you can have um, you can have a complete um, you can have a complete complete spinal cord injury versus an incomplete. So complete spinal cord injury. What simply happens is you have transected the whole spinal cord. Right? So that one is more serious. And what, you, what you're going to lose, you lose everything below the, the segment of the lesion. The rule in, in, in neuro basically is when you get a lesion somewhere, you lose things that are below that lesion. You lose the function of the cord below. Right? So in terms of motor, remember I said the corticospinal fibers that are coming from the brain they would have already decassated. So I will lose motor on the same side because the fibers were already coming on the same side. Um, fine touch, um, proprioception and vibration, I will lose them on the, not, not basically same side, but basically everything below. Maybe we, let's, do away with the same side for now because it's going to be everything because it's a complete lesion. I will lose fine touch and whatever below on both sides. Yeah. Pain and temperature, I will lose both sides. But when it's incomplete, they have different types of uh, incomplete um, incomplete lesions. So it's something called a brown sequad. Uh, brown sequad is, in, uh, is, is more or less um, sequad is more or less hemisection. Hemisection means you've cut the spinal cord in half, but you know in reality that doesn't really happen. There's no way you can, these are things that are more theoretical. But when you cut the spinal cord in half, this is the picture now that tries to test your knowledge to see if you understand. Because let's say you've cut in half, that means you've cut the right spinal cord, the left is okay. So if I've cut the right spinal cord, what, what am I going to lose? In terms of motor, I'll lose on the same side because we say that motor fibers have decassated already. In terms of fine touch, proprioception and vibration, I'll lose on the same side because we said the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus, they carry their fibers on the same side in the spinal cord. But in terms of pain and temperature, remember I said you lose it on the opposite side because the spinothalamic fibers that carry pain and temperature, they cross at the point of 
entry in the spinal cord to go to the opposite side. If they do not cross at the point of entry, they'll go up or down one or two segments, then cross. So the point is they will cross. So you're going to lose whatever you're going to lose on the contralateral side. But for the rest of the neurological deficits, be it motor or the fine touch, it's on the same side. Scientifically, we say ipsilateral side. Right. Okay. Then there are other fancy syndromes that you can get. There's something called anterior cord syndrome. Um, this one, you affect the anterior spinal cord. You're going to lose motor. Um, then also other things like pain and temperature, but that may be beyond your scope uh, for the purpose of anatomy. Then you have something called a central cord syndrome. Remember at the central, at the center of the gray matter, I drew a, a central canal. So that central canal can, <coughs> excuse me, that central canal can cavitate. And when it cavitates, um, it's going to start to compress on uh, nearby structures. And um, the pain and temperature fibers that I say they cross in the spinal cord, they cross in front of that central canal. So imagine that central canal starts to enlarge. What is simply going to happen is you're going to compress those decussating pain fibers. So you affect those pain fibers, right? Other, other ways it can happen, you can, you can have neck hyperextension and the likes. But then what I want you to know for central cord syndrome, there are two theories that explain it, but I want you to know the clinical presentation, not the theories, right? Maybe if you want to do neuro, you can do the theories, but you affect the upper limbs more than the lower limbs. So I'll repeat myself. For central cord syndrome, the motor impairment is more pronounced in the upper limb muscles compared to the lower limb muscles. The theory that maybe... Let, let's just talk about the theories because they help you understand. The theories that work there, number one, remember the hand is more specialized, you know, for technical function. So it is a greater representation in the brain when you do the homunculus or the representation of the body in the brain, right? So with that greater representation, the hand or the upper limb is going to have more nerve fibers and uh, larger diameter fibers. So I'll give you an example. If there are two men in a room and there are 98 women in a room, making it 100 people, two men versus 98 men, then someone randomly sh shoots, who's more likely to die, a man or a woman? It's going to be a woman in this case because you have more women. If it was going to be 98 men versus two, two women, it was going to be a man who's going to be more likely to die. So that is generally the newer theory that is um, accepted to explain why central cord syndrome who affect upper limb muscles more than lower limb muscles. Then when you go to that upper limb, the hand functions more than your biceps. Muscles in the hand, you need them more than your biceps. So distal muscles, muscles in the hand, you guys have done systemic, uh, the regional anatomy, you now know. The muscles in the hand, they receive more innervation, which makes them which makes them more prone to, to damage because they, they have those more fibers. So upper limb muscles are affected more, distal muscles are affected more, right? And of course, not, not forgetting your pelvis anatomy, you had a bladder, right? So most of these syndromes, they are going to present with 
bladder dysfunction because the bladder has that um, lower micturition center, S2, S3, S4, right? Then the spinal cord, remember when we did the first talk, we said it ends um, at the intervertebral disc between L1, L2, or you just say the lower board of L1. Then the rest of the fibers become a quarter equina. So if you get disc herniation, between vertebra and vertebra, there's an intervertebral disc. And usually the nucleus pulposus of that intervertebral disc herniates posterior lateral. So if it compresses the coda equina, we can get something called the coda equina syndrome. Right. And what simply coda equina syndrome has, it's going to have bladder dysfunction because those fibers, part of them are the sacral nerves that innervate the bladder. Part of them are the lumbar nerves for the GIT. So you have bladder dysfunction, bowel dysfunction. So I think the, the point that I'm trying to drive here is when you're doing neuro, think of the whole person, right? You've done the whole anatomy, which makes sense why most schools do neuro after everything. Others start with neuro, which makes it a really hard thing. Then remember your dermatomes in the lower limbs? Yeah, I'm sure you remember them. Um, the sacral nerves, they, 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 they basically innervate in terms of dermatomes, the, um, maybe the, you say the posterior lower limb and the likes, but they also innervate the perianal region. So someone with coda equina syndrome, they also get something called a sedoparesthesia. Um, I'm sure if you, have, um, if you have ridden a horse before, when you get to a point when the horse wants to change um, whatever direction, you have to pull it you get pain on the medial or the inner aspect of the thigh as well as the perineal region. That is the sedo region where you get paresthesia in corda equina syndrome. Why there's paresthesia? Because the corda equina includes the lumbar nerves and the sacral nerves. So you're going to get problems where those lumbar and sacral nerves are supposed to be innervating. Right. Then in as much as trauma and all these funny things can cause spinal cord injury, vascular insufficiency can also cause spinal cord injury. So the spinal cord is supplied by anterior and posterior spinal arteries. The anterior spinal artery will give blood supply to two thirds of the spinal cord the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. Then the posterior spinal arteries, which are two in number. So actually anterior is only one. Remember when I drew the diagram, I said on the anterior side, there's the anterior median fissure. Within that anterior median fissure, that's where you find the anterior spinal artery. But you have two posterior spinal arteries, which you find on the posterior lateral aspect of the spinal cord. They are not in the central uh, sulcus. So those posterior spinal arteries, they supply the posterior third of, um, of your, spinal, your spinal cord, right? So these arteries um, can be affected and you get problems, right? Where are they coming from? They come from the, remember your vertebral arteries coming from the first part of your subclavian artery artery, then there's a cervical part, um, there's a vertebral part, then there's a suboccipital part, and the suboccipital triangle, then they ascend into the cranium as the cranial part. And as they do that, they they join to form a basilar artery. But as they join, uh, they give off the anterior spinal artery. So there's a small tweak from the left vertebral and a small tweak from the right vertebral. They join and give off the anterior spinal arteries. The same vertebral arteries can give off posterior spinal arteries or they'll give a branch um, called uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica. Then that pica gives us a posterior spinal artery. But don't worry about that. We'll do that more when we do the sec of wheelies, so basically the blood supply of the central nervous system. Right. Okay. Um, not so sure if you have questions. I'll open this to questions from what you've been reading. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, that would have a from a spine attitude. But my two posterior, what say they can uh, be branches of the pie can't. They can be branches of the vertebral artery, or uh, they can be branches of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which we can just um, abbreviate as PICA to make our life easy. Posterior uh, inferior cerebellar artery. That, that's what PICA simply stands for. Oh, so uh, my reticular attendance of a pa 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 iota. Okay. So, okay. So, so remember the spinal cord is quite long. It's about 45 centimeters. So these arteries are not sufficient to carry all the blood. So they then get reinforcing arteries. Uh, those are the radicular arteries that you're talking about. So in the thoracic region, you get interco the posterior intercostal arteries, which are branches of the, if you remember the upper two, they're branches of the superior intercostal artery coming from the costal cervical coming from the second part of the subclavian. Then the lower nine are branches directly from the iota. Then in the abdominal region, you get lumbar arteries, which are also branches of the iota. But remember I say the largest reinforcing artery or the largest radicular artery will be your, will be your um, artery of Adam quits, which I just said you can just remember as the great artery of Adam to make life easy for you. So yes, the reinforcing arteries are coming from the iota. Okay. Then I, I I I want you to go look up something for me. I want you to tell me where the anterior spinal artery is narrowest in the spinal cord, and where the posterior spinal artery is narrowest in the spinal cord. Why am I asking this? In those regions where they are already narrow, those regions are prone to ischemia. So I want you to tell me where the anterior or posterior is narrowest in the thoracic spinal cord or in the lumbar spinal cord, and you tell me what implication that is on if you get an ischemic spinal cord. I'm sure if you if you research that on your own, you'll never forget it. I was told this 2019. Somewhere, somewhere there. Yeah, you can ask. Okay. Me. So, Abba, ma, 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 no one is an adjutor. It's complete or it's incomplete? Everything else that I was mentioning, it's incomplete. Complete is where you lose everything totally. No motor, no sensory, no pain in temperature below that, 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 that lesion. But, but when you start to say on this side you lose this, what what that's now incomplete spinal cord injury. Okay. So, it, so it's either complete or incomplete. Then under incomplete, there is a whole lot of things that can happen there. You can, other things that I left out, there's a lateral cord syndrome, posterior cord syndrome. But for the purpose of anatomy. We want you to know brown sequat syndrome more. The reason why we want you to know brown sequat is it tests whether you have understood the anatomy more than these other funny syndromes. So you find that most people describe brown sequat because um, when you examine for it, it tests whether you have understood what's happening to the fibers, where are the fibers in the spinal cord, and what implication um, is there when you get a problem uh on 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 one side so i said uh really diseases don't read books there's no disease that's going to say we are going to cut the spinal cord in half now right maybe it's, it's not really going to happen like that but it it really tests whether you've understood um the concept okay i'll open the foot let's say until uh what Lesion in this shape, uh, cannot for uh, a one the manifestation you know, a segment does affect running it is to is this in actually in the no, I didn't say this. I said if you affect a one spinal cord, for example, you affect everything be 